Pichera. Pichora is an average village, one of thousands in the territory of Ukraine, with its bad roads and abandoned houses on one side, and the most beautiful nature and people, full of optimism, on another side. However, our story is not about present-day Pichora, but about the past events which this village witnessed. First, let me give a little history about Pichora. Its name possibly derived from the word Pichera, which means cave. What makes this village special is its object of interest, which incomprehensively combined the good and the evil, the beauty and the grief. Without going into details, we should mention that in the 17th century, these places attracted Polish magnates. At the most picturesque place, on the bank of the southern Bug River, flowing through the village, a huge castle was built. By the castle, a magnificent park was created. Its terraces were laid all the way down to the river. The last owner of this most beautiful estate was Count Franciszek Potocki. Shortly after the October coup in 1917, the castle was burglarized and then destroyed. On its site, a military hospital was built. It existed here up to the beginning of the war in 1941. Upon the arrival of Hitler's troops, in the territory of the former estate of the Pototskys, the concentration camp for the Jews was organized. The gate to the quiet, magnificent park of Count Pototsky turned into the gate to hell. The former park's ditch, laid from granite stones, turned into the ditch of the concentration camp, where thousands of Jews were herded from the nearest localities of Vinitsa region, such as Bratslav, Magilov Podolsky, Tulchin, Trostenets, Ladezhin, Shpikov, Jurin, and others. The camp was related to the Romanian zone of occupation, so-called Transnistria. That is why the significant number of the Jews deported from Bessarabia, Romania, and Bukovina happened to be here. The camp was controlled by the Romanian Germanderie and local collaborationists, the Ukrainian policemen. From time to time, German units would come to the camp and take some prisoners for execution. The prisoners most capable of working here were taken to the construction of Hitler's headquarters near Vinitsa. No one came back alive from there. The camp's prisoners were dying from hunger, cold, and diseases. According to different sources, the number of prisoners who died there ranges from 30,000 to 40,000. By the time the camp was liberated by the Red Army, there were only 300 to 400 people living there. The prisoners called their camp the Dead Loop from the name of the marine rope knot, which is impossible to untie. In this movie, we will tell you what was going on in the camp and how the prisoners were surviving there. My name is Morris Bronstein. Let me give a little about the prehistory of making of this documentary. In 1994, the movie Schindler's List was released. Inspired by the work on this movie, the famous American film director Steven Spielberg created Shoah the USC Shoah Foundation to record on videotape and preserve the memories of the survivors and witnesses of the Holocaust. Over the course of several years, the foundation collected some 55,000 video evidences in 64 countries. In 1997, I was invited as an interviewer to participate in the Steven Spielberg Foundation work. Over several years, I was fortunate to take more than 70 interviews in Ukraine and the United States, which were given by the former prisoners of the ghetto and concentration camp, the Dead Loop. 
in the village of Pechora. In 2013, my book, The Dead Loop, with testimonials by the prisoners who I interviewed, was published. The book was published in Russian and then translated into English. After that, the idea arose to create this documentary film based on the testimonies of the prisoners who survived in the Pechora concentration camp. Taking this opportunity, I express my deep gratitude to the Steven Spielberg Foundation for the invitation to participate in this project. I also thank all the former prisoners who agreed to give me their interviews. My special thanks are to Sergei Kotelko, my Ukrainian colleague, friend, associate, and director. I also thank you, dear viewers, for watching this film. Thus, I introduce the documentary, The Concentration Camp Dead Loop, to you. Watch it. Remember. On June 22, they said on the radio that the war had begun. Did they talk about any preconditions for the outbreak of war before that? Before that, there were no preconditions. Nobody knew anything. But as you are saying, you had a radio? We had a loudspeaker. Yes, there was broadcasting. So you did not hear anything in those broadcastings? You were already a big boy at that time, weren't you? Yes, I was 13. Didn't those broadcasts say something about what was going on in Europe? They said that there were preparations at the borders, regrouping of the troops. Those talks had been there all the time. We knew about the agreement with Germany. Molotov went to Germany at the time of the agreement, issuing... Uh, we heard about all of it, but... We did not hear about any preconditions, so we personally did not know that the war would begin. When a war begins, panic begins. People start buying out soap, salt, matches. People start getting ready. Moreover, my father took part in, in the World War I, and he knew what war meant. In our house, we were getting ready for the worst that might happen, but nobody knew that it would be this kind of war. There was panic. The officials started leaving the place. My grandfather had two horses. He could already ride at that time, and we decided to leave as well. So we rode about 30, 40, or 50 kilometers away. Who are we? Your grandfather, your grandmother, and who else? My grandfather, my grandmother, my grandfather's daughter, who he had with second wife, me, my mother, my sister, my father, and my little brother. My brother was serving in Lubaczow at the border with Poland. When he came, he told us that they could see from their side how Germans were forcing the Jews to sweep out the road with toothbrushes. We already knew about atrocities of the Germans from my brother. When the Germans came, they showed their horrendous faces right away. They grabbed 20 old people and threw them from the bridge into the river. Then that bunch of bandits, as they can be called, broke into synagogue. Our house was near the synagogue. That's why we could see everything. Its windows were facing the river. They rolled out Torah from these windows down to the river like, like runners, threw out the sacred books and burned them, made a fire from them. They were dancing, playing harmonicas, and were happy. How those bastards were able to do such things like burning the books while they had words get meet uns. God is with us on buckles of their belts. They burned all of them. The Jewish community was created and it had its own police. They found bastards, the Jews, who were at first brainwashed and intimidated, of course. They started serving the Germans as policemen. During the raid, the main task of a Jewish policeman was to walk with a Romanian and a local policeman. 
So he was taking them into people's homes and, th and showed them, like here, Kaplan lives, here, Lerner lives, and so on and so forth. When they first started taking the Jews to Pechora, and when people were taken to work at the railway bridge for the first time, those people, those bastards, I don't call them anything else, they would go to the apartments and showed where the Jews were living. They knew the families and all the members of the households. They would come into a house, and if only an old woman was inside and no one else around, while he knew who actually lived there, he would tell the remaining guy that she was not willing to say where the rest of the family was, and they would beat and brutalize her. There was a dressmaker in Mogilev by the name of Krupin, a high-class tailor. When the raid was undertaken in order to bring the Jews to Pechora, he was visited by a hunchback learner who came into his house with a Romanian guy. So the man decided that, okay, I would go with them. He just wanted to save his 16-year-old son, who was hiding in the attic. He asked where his son was and responded, I don't know, he has walked away somewhere. So that parasite learner went upstairs together with the local policeman, found his son in the attic and threw him downstairs, not letting him walk down himself and took him away. The boy perished in Pechora exactly a week after he was brought there from Mogilev. This death is on the conscience of that learner. There were very many such cases. But ultimately, all those policemen were sent to Pechora. When all those policemen did what they were supposed to do, they all were sent to Pechora. In 1943, there were no policemen here, not a single policeman. It's impossible to mention everything what the local Ukrainian policemen were up to. One of the name, one of them by the name Saraban, was on top of everything an alcoholic addict. In the morning, he would walk to the city, and while he was walking through the alley, he was shouting, "Hey, Yids, get out! I will beat you!" Some of the people walked out, some did not. When he was walking back around noon after filling himself up with vodka. He did not miss any house, where he either would break windows, or, if the door was unlocked, he would walk in and beat everyone with no good reason at all, just beat them and leave. In the evening of the 6th, our father's friends came over. My father had always been friends with the Ukrainians. It was common. One of them, his last name was Anton Yok, had no kids of his own. He told my father, you know, Hankel, they will come tomorrow to take people somewhere. Let me take your little Fira, your mirror, clock, and something else you have valuable. I will take your Fira. I don't have children and she is blondish, looking more like a Russian girl, so she will be able to stay with me. So my father asked me, Fira, will you go? I said, how can I go? I am not leaving you. I will only be with you. They insisted and my father would say, come on, Fira, go. I said, no, I will be where you will be. How can I leave you? I don't want to live without you. I will go where you go. One nice day at dawn, I only remember it was Friday. You will ask, how do you remember that it was Friday? Because on Fridays, we always bake bread for Saturdays. So the mother baked the bread for Saturday. At dawn, there were butt jokes in the doors and windows. They started bringing us outside. Nobody knew where we had to get ready to go. We were just given five minutes to pack. What were you able to grab in those five minutes just to dress into something? We were only two kids, my sister and me. Who were those people who came and told you to get ready? They were not civil people to come to warn us. They were Germans, Romanians, policemen. Who would possibly notify us? They just hit the doors and broke the windows with the butts and waited until we came out. There was no other people, only those raiders. On the 7th in the morning, it was still dark. 
It was Friday for sure because we baked bread. The mother baked our bread. Then we heard shouting and noise, and we heard that everyone was being forced to come out. Two sisters of my mother came running to our place. A female neighbor living lower the synagogue also came running to our place. Then a housewife with two boys came running to our place, and we started hiding in our house. We were hiding because our parents knew how gangs could be. Today they force you to come out, and tomorrow they could stop doing that, so maybe we would be able to stay home. We had been hiding for the whole week. A week later, we ran out of water. So the father took the buckets and came out, and they found us right away and forced us to come outside. They gave us two minutes to get ready. We took whatever we were able to take, and they brought us to school number one. School number one was a former Jewish school. When we came to the school, we saw what was going on there. Some people were inside there already, since before us, they had brought two groups of people there. The abandoned children were lying on the window seals. They would not allow anybody to use the restroom, so people would go to the toilet randomly and everywhere. They were collecting people in the school until they had enough for a full-size column. So we spent a couple days in that school. We were standing up there with no food or anything else. We would look out the windows and see the dogs and cats running along the road. They had a right to be on the street, but we were locked in. We were being held there in the worst conditions than cattle. On December 31st, 1941, it was extremely freezing weather. There was lots of snow and it was impossible even to come inside. They made us get up at four o'clock in the morning. The policeman forced everybody to come outside and form up a column. What were the three of us able to take from home? I was only 14, my brother was 10, and our mama was sick. Therefore, we had only what we were wearing. We took some money which we had, each of us took a little knapsack and went into the column. That column was one and a half kilometers long. So what to say, from our house to the bridge, it was about one and a half kilometer column from five to 10 people wide. The policemen had dogs with them. They were, were also the Germans and the Romanians. So they placed us into that column. We were standing and freezing while they were going back to the houses. When they found somebody there, they shot them right away and then took away the corpses to the Bug River and threw them under the ice. Around 10 o'clock, that column started moving. At dawn, we were all taken to school number one. Before the war, that school was a Jewish one. After they filled the school full, we were herded again. We were being herded, we didn't know. They told us to come out in groups of 100 or 200 or 300 people. They brought us over into the bathhouse, but not through the front door, but through the back door where coal was lying. There we were told to take our clothes off to get disinfected. And for that purpose, we needed to wash ourselves. We did not wash ourselves, of course, but we were given shots, and it was also upon the orders of that Dr. Bielski. Did they explain to you what kind of shots they were? Nobody explained anything to us. They just said it was done for us not to get sick. At that time, we already heard that it was done so we actually would get sick. We saw people who got those shots getting sick. Do you understand me? It was a holiday, Hanukkah. What month was it? It was December. It was snowy and freezing weather. When we got there today, you will see, now it is the road covered in asphalt, but at that time it was a swamp up to your knees there. It was very difficult to walk. We had to carry my little brother. 
There were old people, 80 and 90 years old. Everybody was herded there. We walked for a very long time, and it was very hard. On the road, if anybody wanted to bend down to drink or even from a puddle, they could be hit with a butt or shot or hit with a stick. We did not know where we were being herded. Did you see how people were killed? Of course, of course. I saw everything with my own eyes. There were old people who fell down and never got up. Those who got behind and were not able to walk were shot right away. I saw it with my own eyes. I was not small. I was in my 13th year. I even remember that it was helping both my mother and father to carry my little brother in my arms. It was hard for me to carry him, but I did it. Those who fell down were shot right away and dragged aside. We were escorted by Germans, Romanians, and policemen. They would pull out the 16 and 18 year old girls from the column, rape them right there on the snow before everybody and shot them. And when we were being herded, very many dead people remained on the road. They were either killed by a butt or a bullet. If you get behind on the road, they hit you. If you don't want to do something, they hit you. Especially the policemen and gendarmes who were walking with whips. They hit you a few times with the whip and you are not able to get up. But if you don't get up, they will shoot you. They would hit us all the time like cattle. While shepherding the cattle, they hit and herd it. They did the same to us. It was entertaining for them. So even if you were not guilty of anything, they would hit you anyway. People would run out from the villages to throw to the road, to throw something into the column. They were not permitted to come close. The guards would fire into the air or chase them away with sticks. We were being herded exactly like war prisoners, escorted by the Germans, Romanians, dogs, and policemen. I remember the dogs were in our case. I don't know about other cases, but I am talking about our group. You were not permitted to turn aside. Later, people told us there were at least 3,000 people in that column, not fewer. I know how much time it took. We were brought into the horse barn. Now, I know, it was the village of Turkov. The horse barn was empty. There was a swamp up to your waist. The Germans, Romanians, and policemen were drinking and partying the whole night. We were lying in that bud, mud. There were very many people who did not get up from it. Some of them died immediately in that horse barn. Was it cold? Was it a freezing weather? Of course it was cold. It was December the 7th. The column was moving till evening. In the evening, barely alive, as they say, we reached Wyofsky village. There we were herded into the horse barn. How many kilometers were between Vyshkovtsi and Bratslav? Maybe about eight kilometers. There was a lot of manure and we were happy that it was there so we could warm ourselves up a little. Many people remained outside as there was not enough room for everyone in the horse barn and the cow house. By the morning, again, there were countless corpses. We went into the column again and started walking. In the morning, they started shooting into the air and hurting us out. Everybody walked out and formed the column. Those who were not able to come out were shot at the spot. Did you see it with your own eyes? Of course, I saw it with my own eyes. I only tell what I saw with my own eyes. The Germans were shooting people so easily and so heartlessly as if they were shooting either into hares or into trees. I saw it with my own eyes. And those corpses? The corpses remained there. 
Well, maybe they were removed after we walked away because there were very, very many graves. We were herded maybe for a kilometer, maybe less. Then they started shooting into the air to stop the column. We stopped. They selected about 20 to 25 men. I can't tell for sure, as I did not count them. I only knew that they were pulled to the roadside and shot. We were told that they tried to escape. We were brought from Vap Vapnyaka to Pechora by the horse carts. All of us were put on the horse carts. They were, they were driven by the regular peasants from the villages. The horse carts were big and moved by two horses each. We were escorted by two Romanians riding horses. No one else was there. They did not need to have a big escort, as everyone was beaten and exhausted. We were herded like cattle, even worse. Again, they did not give us food or drink. We were not allowed either to bend down or to step to the side. By the evening, the second day, we were brought to that concentration camp in Pechora. Only by evening, we reached Pechora village. We heard before that the Count Petoski's estate was there. By the evening, we came into this village. Of course, we were barely alive, hungry, and very cold. They opened the gate. There were armed policemen standing at the gate with the dogs. It was Pechora, as we knew it. Some time ago, it had been a sanatorium there. It was a high stone fence around it, barbed with wire stretched over it, and the fence was, I think, about two meters high. It was the Count Pororsky's estate. How they came to a thought to choose such a place, it was so scary. The gate was opened and we were herded in there and then the gate was locked. You had to have a special mind. I don't know what else to choose such place in Pechora. It was a perfect place for that kind of an undertaking. It had a huge stone fence on three sides and the Bug River was on the fourth side where one would be able to go only to drown themselves into the river. It was not that easy. When we walked into that yard, there were already some people there. Where they were from, I don't know. We walked into the building. It had neither windows nor doors. It was freezing weather, maybe minus 30 degrees centigrade, and people lay down where they were able to. We all lay down on the floor and spent the night either sitting or standing or lying. We saw a picture, a big crowd of people, a huge one. For me, an eight-year-old boy at the time, it felt like I was coming to a big city. You didn't know anyone there. There was one unfinished building. It was called a refrigerator. We named it because it had a roof, but there was only a window frames and not everywhere. The doors were just standing at the walls and it had cement floors. It was a main building and we were among those who managed to walk there. It was called Barak. It had a kitchen, a steam bath, some people went there right away, and there were also wooden barracks on the side. This was the main building which I was telling you about. On the left and on the right, there were barracks. There was also auxiliary premises where the prisoners of the concentration camp were held. to Pechora, do you remember your, your first impressions of the camp? You were very young, but do you remember anything when you first came into the camp? Uh, yeah, I remember what I remember when they brought us to Pechora. Uh, there's a river, Salzburg, 
the name of the river, yeah, Bug. And there's a nice place before World War II. It was, I told you, it was a, a resort for sick tuberculosis people. But uh, before the revolution, it was a, a Polish, uh, Polish, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, the rich people in Poland, they have been. It was his private resort. So it was a nice place. There was a, a huge uh, te temple there and uh, a huge building. Uh, but when we, we came there, I remember this, the building, I remember from the first time, the river, and it was so nice there. We stayed in a horse barn because the building was so crowded, crowded there was, was a lot of people over there. And uh, they placed us in a horse barn. As far as any kind of laboratory facility? Oh no, <laughs> nothing. We used to sleep in clothes. Our bed was straw. Our pillow was straw also, and covered with some clothes what you have. And the sanitation was? <laughs> it was nothing. It was nothing. Of course, the windows were broken, since they were bombing the sugar plant and shooting. So the windows fell from the detonation. We took off some of our clothes to cover up the broken windows and slept very close to each other, like seeds. The doors were open widely and our torment started from the very first day. We were not given any food or drinks. Some people were able to bring some bread or their belongings, just what they grabbed, and we were given very little time to get ready. All of that did not hold out long. We were herded there and we felt right away that would not be any other way out from here for us. Only death. Before the war, it was a military health resort there. And my brother, who was a major, took a rest there. And later his father and mother died there. This is how it can turn. In a few days, the second group of people was brought here, also a big one. Then the third group was brought. Then they started catching small groups of 100, 200, or 300 people. When we were herded in there, there was a crowd of people, maybe 200 or 300. It was scary to look at them. They looked like skeletons, half naked, with ragged clothes on them. You, you, you can see such skeleton in the school. They were crying and asking for food. We still had some food with us, and when we would throw a piece of bread to them, they would fall to it, strangling each other, and then somebody ultimately would grab the bread, choke on it, and die immediately, right there at the spot. They brought us here from Atslov, from Troitsienitz, and they shot people in Leitizen. Those who had run away from Lyatsin and happened to be in Bratislav were caught there and brought here too. Some people from Nimarovka were shot and some of them happened to be in Bratislav. They were all brought here as well. Maybe there were a few people from Nitsa in the camp. They even had people who were evacuated from Poland and from some other locations. What was the purpose of this camp? We only, uh, they let us know, the authorities, the Soviet Union, after World War II. So in 1942, uh, the Germans started uh, to construct a huge bunker, underground bunker for Hitler and his military command. He wanted to be closer to the battlefield. So they surrounded this place by camps, prisons of war, civilians. Then they selected people from the camps for the construction site. And nobody knows up to today where they killed those people because there shouldn't be no evidence, no witnesses, mm -hmm. what they did there. 
The Germans used to come uh, with soldiers, big trucks, twice a month and select the strong, they are understanding strong people, uh, healthy people, and they took them to their construction site, what I said before. And nobody came back. Nobody knows even where they disappeared. They killed them and buried on the ground. I think so. Behind the horse barn, there was a bakery. It became both a canteen and a bakery. Was it a functioning bakery at that time? Yes. They baked bread there, which they gave us to eat. Not too much, but they were giving us some bread. They were also giving us some soup, since there was a canteen there. But it was only water in that soup. How did they give you the soup? How was it happening? Was it inside the canteen? Did you come there? We would come up there. We were, we were given bowls. We sipped a couple of times, and that soup was gone. You would sip from your bowl and then give your bowl to the next person. How much bread did they give you into your hand? Just a piece, maybe 100 grams. That bread was half of sawdust. And I remember that, for some reason, they would bring us some food. It was the beginning of 1942, in January or February. In the middle or at the end of the day, they would bring to us a bucket with pea soup. But I actually cannot remember that soup, as they would not let me come close to it. When they would bring it in, I could see that it had there some pea wastes, you know, a kind of broth. What was under them, I don't know. But the thing is that I never really had it, since as soon as they would come in with it, everybody would pounce upon that bucket, and eventually the bucket was turned over and the soup was spilled. I am often asked, it is impossible, how could the Jews act that way? The Jews are humans, like everybody else. There was one and only one kitchen there, which was used to feed the camp prisoners. But actually, the prisoners were almost not fed there. They gave them some soup, like every other day, if they gave it to them at all. This kitchen served all policemen and all service people. The kitchen had food waste, like peeled skin, bones and bread. The kitchen scrapyard, a dump site, was only one place where one would be able to get something to eat. We used to say that people who worked at the kitchen lived well. The camp prisoners were taken there every day. They would chop wood, take ashes away, wash the pans and so on. Good or bad, but during that day, with such workers spent at the kitchen, they of course ate there, and as much as they were able to, they would take out everything which was possible to hide in their pockets. They rolled up their pants legs inside and sewed them, so they formed additional pockets. That way, they got food for those who did not have anything to eat. I will tell you one episode. We the kids were running around that kitchen and peeled potatoes. You, you can imagine what kind of potatoes they were. They, that peel was just like cigarette paper. We were fighting with each other to be able to grab that peel, which we, we were dried in the sun and ate. It was better for us than chips, which they sell now. My mother sometimes worked in their uh, headquarters of the guards. Uh, they um, took her... She was sweeping floors, preparing something to bring in water, something else, and then in the kitchen. And they, in the kitchen worked one Ukrainian woman from the village. She helped her. Sometimes she, has, she used to give her some food and my mother brought. That's probably that we survived. But two grandmothers died from starvation, from maybe illnesses. My younger brother as well. How was the camp fenced? There was a stone fence on three sides. A beautiful stone fence of the Potatsky's castle was there. At some places it was just from stones. It was a very old setting, a thick ancient fence. 
and one side was with barbed wire. Was there barbed wire from the bottom to the top? Yes, it was barbed wire from the bottom to the top. No, no, I think below was a basic construction and on his top was barbed wire, Seem, seems like that. Were the peasants from local villages coming up to the barbed wire? Yes, peasants were coming up to the barbed wire and exchanged, say, some flour for a pair of boots or, or, or some beans for a shirt. Such an exchange cost many people their lives. My wife's grandmother was killed there. Are you talking about your future wife? Yes, my future wife. I did, I did not know her at the time. They hit her grandmother with a stick and killed her. The country women from Pechora and their kids would push pieces of bread, lard, and everything they were able to through the fence holes and throw them over the fence. It was very risky for them. The police would chase them away. Sometimes when they caught somebody, they would beat them really badly. But nevertheless, the camp territory bordered with the Boog River and it was possible for the peasants to come close from the southern side. The Russians and Ukrainians would bring some potatoes or pieces of bread to fence to the fence and throw them over it. They were not able to save everybody. Somebody got a potato, somebody did not. Some people were exchanged things for food. When it was not the strict quarantine time, one was able to come up to the fence when the quarantine was strict, no one was able to come up there. I'm interested. How were they actually passing you the food? They were throwing the food over the fence. The fence was high. They were at one side. They were shouting, who is over there? Who is over there? Call such and such to come over here. They were coming up to the fence and shouting. What about the guards? The guard was already too far a few meters away. He did not touch those people until while he approached some people, the other people were able to come up to the fence. Do you understand? One policeman was here. Another policeman was there. They were not standing very close to each other. It was a distance between them. Did those people come in contact with policemen? Maybe. To get a non-official permission? What permission? What are you talking about? Just to give him some bribe or alcohol? They would throw everything there that they were able to. Some bread cut into pieces, like square pieces. Also meat, apples, pears, bones, and mamaliga. And that way the people maintained their lives. There was no other way. Our local people helped us a lot. Without the local people, there would not be too many survivors. What about the side of the entrance gate? No one was permitted to come up there. There were guards there. If you wanted to die, you could come up to it. Outside, there were gendarmerie and policemen. Inside, there were the Jewish policemen. The Jewish policemen? Yes, the Jewish policemen. So there was not possible to approach the camp. It was a booth over there. They would bring their people who they had caught. Now it is sealed up. When people were brought into it, the policemen and the Romanians would be beating them to half-dead condition. They would pull half-dead people from there and drop them. Now, how about how we were getting water? At first, there was a spring. So we found that spring and started drawing water from it. To draw water, you need a vessel. No one had any vessels. 
Somebody had a jar, somebody had a bottle, somebody had a mug. No one just had a clue what to take from home. Not even what to take. They must, they just did, didn't allow you to take anything. What would you be able to take with you within five minutes? So we were drawing water from there. There was a commandant by the name of Beres Yuk, without an arm, one of the locals. He was not a man, but a beast, a superman. They said he used to get be a pilot and lost his arm, or he was a tankman. Some people were saying different things. What he actually used to be, I don't know. He was walking around the camp. If you got a drop of water while he was in a bad mood, he would hit you with his foot in the mouth and spill that drop of water so you could not have anything to drink. When the river was frozen, you know, the boys particularly thought it would be easy for them to climb over those stones and get to the other side, and somebody would give them a piece of bread there. They were killed instantly. The Bug River was red from blood since there were lots of corpses in there. On the other side of the Bug River, the Germans were staying. When you walk over there to the river to fill your mug with water, that German, if he wants, he lets you draw water. And if he doesn't want to, he aims and shoots you. He determines whether he can shoot you. So you remain lying in the water. In the winter, the kids try to walk to the opposite side of the frozen Boog River while the Germans were standing on another side, learning how to shoot. The ice was red from the blood of kids' dead bodies. They killed so many more there. What kind of Germans were there? There were Germans on that side of the river and on that side were the Romanians. They were the safety guards there. Was it German territory? Yes, it was the German territory. Why did they shoot? People crawled to the river to take some water and the Germans were walking out there. And as soon as they noticed there's somebody, they would aim at them and kill for fun. So they entertained themselves that way? <laughs> they entertained themselves for sure. What else they were killing people for? Just for fun. We understand that later, since the Germans are very punctual, they had their lunch at a certain time, so we started drawing water from the river only when they were having their lunch. It became easier otherwise. Many people would have been killed right near the water. So there were people who figured out that they needed to go at lunchtime. Well, we passed the information to each other from the lower level to upper. They were crawling in small groups of two or three people. It was not easy to do it in the winter time. Water needed to be brought from the Bug River. It was something awful. There were so many steps, so to get down to the river, they would sit down and slide on the snow. But to walk back up the hill was a challenge. You had to crawl up with that kettle, and water in that kettle was only for cooking, something to eat. There was no way that that water would be used for hand washing. Nobody even thought about that. We did not wash ourselves during winter. We could not do anything like that. There was a moment when it was snow lying outside, but it was difficult to find clean snow since all snow was full of lice. People were coming outside and shaking lice off their clothes. If you pick under your armpit, you would pull out the hand, full handful of lice. We were sitting all day picking lice on each other and killing them. That was our main occupation there. Since nothing was actually cooked for us, people adapted themselves to that. In order to cook some meal, they would put a row of bricks and another row of bricks and put a couple of iron sticks on top of them across. People who were first to come to the camp were able to find those bricks and iron sticks to do that. So apparently, somebody was bringing chopped wood to the camp for them, and they made fire. It was called a kitchen. They were staying outside and wakening fire with a flat piece of wood or a piece of cardboard. 
One needed to pay those women for a possibility to cook or warm up some food. Outside the camp, down the hill, by the Boog River, the country guys were fishing with rods. The current of southern Boog River is fast there. They were just sitting and fishing. They did not take the little fishes which they had caught. It was purely for the sake of hunting. All that fish was thrown over the fence, and those who were fortunate to get a fish or two were very happy. It was a drop in the ocean. What they were able to pass to us was so little. Today they came and brought us something, but during three or five days later, nobody brought us anything. Yes, there was a marketplace there. The market was in the basement of the same length as that sanatorium. They would come there to sell something. And I was sent there too to shout, Ez la tanen, hot hash browns. The meal was made from grated potatoes. I was given 10 pieces. I was told that if I sell them, then they would give one piece for us. Of course, all of them were snatched away from my hands, with no money paid, and I came back crying. I was never selling anything since that time. I want to mention starvation. People got awfully sick. People ate whatever was possible. Grass green plants and leaves, which they picked in the park. There was a very big park there and they picked there everything they were able to and ate it. I remember one moment, which embedded forever in my recollection. I was a girl. I came out to the corridor. Everyone who was watching me telling me this, please forgive me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. There were sick people all along the corridor and we had no place to go to the bathroom since they wouldn't let us come outside. So we used that corridor. A totally naked guy was running around that corridor. He had a black beard, blue eyes. He was such a handsome guy. I had never seen such handsome guys. Only nowadays, I can see good looking guys with beards. He was covering his private parts and asking over and over again, a stiekele breit, a stiekele breit, a stiekele breit, a piece of bread. He was a Romanian. He was not a Ukrainian Jew. He was somewhere from another side. They were all saying, Maxik de Mishugana loiv choin ayum. Crazy Maxik runs everywhere. His name was Maxik, Max. I will never forget the scene in that house. Never in my life will I forget that dirty corridor. The most dreadful thing was starvation to death. You see a person lying next to you. We were lying for three years there. We did not have anything on the floor to lay on. A person is laying just next to you, talking to you, and suddenly becomes quiet. That's all. He or she is dead. In the basement, there was an isolation unit. It was so scary to look inside there and see how adults and children were suffering there. They would throw down their people who had no relatives anymore. People who were lying in the room were barely able to look at suffering of those who were dying of hunger. We were kids. Sometimes we looked down there. Poor children were swollen. They were lying there and suffering. It's so hard to talk about this. It seems to me that there is nothing worse than to die of hunger. First of all, everybody was swollen. Their skin chapped. It was just impossible. It was such tremendous suffering. I don't know if anything else on earth could be like that. Excuse me. Many people would not believe in what I say. I told people in the other place about this, 
and they said it was not true. I would walk to the place where the people use the bathroom, collect cherry stones there, wash them in the fountain, and break those cherry stones with a rock and eat the kernels. I was picking and eating grass. They were saying that grass was similar to garlic or onions. I'm wondering how the Pechora concentration camp was governed. Who was the head of it? Who was its commandant? Did the Jewish prisoners take part in the camp management? We did not know. You did not know? No. We knew that there were the policemen at the gate, armed with rifles. Who and where they were from, we had no idea. Nobody came to us. Nobody talked to us. Nobody asked us. We did not know where the commandant's office was or who was there. That was unknown to us. There was its own government, and the head's name was Zimmerman. I remembered Zimmerman. Among the others, Dr. Vishnevsky, a Jew, stood out. I remember him now, just like then. I saw him around here after the war as well. I remember him wearing a shawl, collar coat, a bowler, and carrying a stick. I will show you the house where all the elite used to live. I remember his actions and what he did. They talked to him. Herr Doctor. I am sick. If you are sick, go ahead and die. People possessing gold or golden teeth crowns had some help from him. A serious typhus and dysentery epidemic broke out. We had nothing to eat. At that time, Bietsky would come with Stoyanov, the head of the police, to watch how many people die from his medicine daily. He said, they would do something to us so we would not live too long. They would not kill anyone. People would die themselves and they would free this camp from people pretty quickly. Do you understand? So he comes to the camp, stands here and asks, how many people have died today? They tell him a hundred. Oh no, that's too few. It's very few, it should be much more. He, per his calculations, knew if he had been a certain number, if there had been a certain number of shots administered, then the epidemia was supposed to spread. At the window to the right, a man was lying. Before the war, he used to work as a chief accountant at Kryansovka Sugar Plant. He was dying of hunger. It was so hard. He was such a big man. He was shouting, Oh God, I had quite a job. How could I think that such a thing would ever happen to me? Why didn't I evacuate? Why did I stay here? So now I have to die of hunger? Nobody was able to receive money without me. I had such a position and have to die of hunger now. That's shouting, all of it. We were lying during that winter. We did not dream about anything. We just dreamt that at least somebody, at least somebody's spirit would survive to tell the world how we were living there. Children were killed being half dead. Lately, I recollected an episode. There was a woman lying nearby in front of us. She had a baby with her. The baby was asking her for some food. She had nothing to give her baby, and in order to, I don't know, I just cannot even talk about that. She put her baby down and stepped on that baby a few times. It happened before our eyes in our room. Did she kill the baby? Yes, she killed the baby when she stepped on him. He was one or two years old. I was sick of typhus that time. I remember that episode. It was exactly that way. She stepped on the baby, danced on him, and killed him. You know how many corpses there were there every day? It is so heartbreaking to tell. There were sleds and people harnessed onto them. There were no horses. The sleds were standing in front of the camp. The corpses were thrown onto them. However, during the night, those sleds were full of corpses, not just once. On the left hand of the camp, there was a barn. They would throw the dead bodies into it. 
The bodies got frozen, and when they needed to separate them from each other, the arms and legs were separated from the corpses. They tried to remove those corpses from the rooms as soon as possible. It is extremely heartbreaking to tell how it felt to see a dead mother lying and her baby was sucking her breast while lice were eating up both the mother and the baby. There were big bunches of lice, really big, sitting everywhere on them. Were all the camp prisoners living in the same hard conditions, or were there some people who managed to live not in such hard conditions? There were such people. If you please, tell me more about that. Well, there were a few families who paid the policemen and they gave those people a kind of pantry room or a kitchen or some other room, I don't know. They lived in a separate building with, where they were not like 50 people in a room, although it was in that territory, but just two or three families. One couple even got married there. So everything like that happened there. And for the money, it was possible. What do you mean they got married? Did they arrange a wedding ceremony there? No marriage ceremony. That woman, she was f from Dzurin, and the man was from Proskov. They had money and gold. They occupied a separate room where there were three or four families, and they started living together. Do you know anyone who gave birth there? No, that definitely did not happen there. Nobody gave birth to babies there. So how they used to bury those people? I did not tell you the main thing. They used to bury those people. You know, they had two sticks and two poles. They would come to the room and ask, how many dead people do you have? Five, six, Ten. So they would pull them out. They already were the skeletons, no meat, no bones. People were walking with big swollen bellies and with huge blisters on their legs. That was awful. So it seems totally unbelievable that I went through all of this. Please excuse me. No one can even, even think about that, but how to go through all of that? They took my little brother too. They would carry out these bodies with their heads, arms, and legs hanging down. And they were carrying them on two sticks and two poles. These people who were carrying the bodies were not able to carry them one by one, while from 100 to 150 people died every day. Bietsky would come there each day and ask, why so few people were dying, he said, they should make a strict quarantine. The strict quarantine meant that nobody would be permitted to come outside the building or barracks. Everyone should be lying in the rooms for a day or two. The sewage was accumulating there. There was nowhere to use a bathroom. Well, we kept on saying that there were too few corpses. This was un indescribable and unspeakable. My brother died and he was buried but I don't even know where he was buried. I just came to the Jewish cemetery and bowed to every grave. So I don't know where his grave is. When my father died, it was warmer weather. The snow was melting. It was in April and it was epidemi. The corpses were driven through the village in order not to contaminate the village. That told us, they told us that we should start burying people in the forest. There's a plot there, I will show you. Those dead people were supposed to be taken to the cemetery, but who would be able to carry them up the hill to Pechora? I cannot even imagine that they were able to carry anyone there to bury. When spring came, they even prohibited to bury people there since the dead bodies were lying everywhere in the village and they were typhoid. They started a new cemetery in the woods so that those bodies would be buried only there. 
Then September of 1942 came. The local country people from the villages nearby were walking with shov shovels toward Mazurvoka village. They were walking through the camp and telling the prisoners to run away because they were walking there to dig holes in the ground. The people from the camp were supposed to be shot and buried there. But where would we go? We were herded to the camp and the Tulchin habitants were brought here. After them, people from Bratslov were brought, then from Shikvov, then from Pechora, from Trostjenets, and from Ladizen. They were many Bukovonian Jews, the Bessaraba Jews, and the Jews from Romania. Each time it became fuller and fuller with people. Nobody from the newcomers to the camp said that there were settlements somewhere where the Jews could live normally. So we decided there was no place for us to run away to, and we just waited. <laughs> I am the master of the Shpikov forestry. At this moment, we are in the territory of the natural reserve of Mazurivska Dubina, which borders with burials like Babiyar in Kiev, where innocent people were buried during the time of fascist occupation. We have delegations coming from Israel, Poland, and so on. In Vinitsa, we have a joint organization with Holland. They conduct excursions here and show how the Germans tortured people here. Right now we are in the territory where innocent people were shot and buried. Ahead of me there are two big ditches. On the left hand there is another ditch, which the Germans did not use, since they did not have time to shoot and bury people there. Is this the one behind you? One of them? Yes. There are also graves behind this monument. These graves are just like common graves. In 1967 to 1970, they wrote here that 8,000 Soviet Jews were buried here. But actually, there were about 20,000 Jews. This burial is all along this territory's length. Many children were buried here. Did the head say that the Germans were coming here and leaving little notes? Yes, the Germans were coming here and asking for forgiveness. Those notes said that such and such Germans came here and are asking for forgiveness for our people's acts. You know, there were no people in the camp healthy enough to dig those ditches. The ditch was about 150 meters long. There were four ditches like these. Two and a half of them are filled for now with dead people. One is staying half filled like a memorial. From the beginning, they buried in one territory, and when these ditches were ready, they started burying there. By the way, I must tell you that a horse was walking around the camp. It was a long horse cart with one wood board, and each time they were picking up half-dead people and corpses. They were being brought to the place where the common graves were prepared. It's the place where we have put the monument. They were bringing them there. Heads and legs were hanging down from the cart. Yes, that was common. That was the way it had to be. It was cleaning. That horse was cruising around for the whole day. Did that horse have enough jobs to do every day? Yes, it had, every day. How many corpses were taken away from the camp daily? Up to 50 or more, every day. Now about how they carry the corpses away. People were harnessed into carts in the summer and into the sledges in the winter and they drag those corpses by themselves. Sometimes some of the prisoners laid under the corpses 
and escape from the camp. Even so? Yes, even so, the kids would lay down there and the corpses were laid on top of them and they were brought outside the camp and they escaped. The square remembers something else. In wintertime of 1942, 1943, and 1944, the corpses were brought mostly here. They were brought right here and put on the snow, and then the sledges came, and they were throwing the corpses on them like chopped wood. The corpses were brought to the ditches and then buried there. They were brought along this road. By this road? Yes. Please tell me more about this. That is a burial like Babi Yar. The corpses were brought there by horse carts or cars. On the left hand, the old border used to be here, but no one will find its exact place now. Well, we were sitting there having nothing to exchange for food. We had nothing to do but die. We had nothing to eat. I overheard that some of the boys tried to escape in the night. They ran into the villages to get at least a piece of bread. I told my mother that I wanted to go there to maybe somebody would take me with them. She said, well, but your brother escaped. He wanted to get something. He said he would go to Tolchin. He knew somebody there and they might give him some food, but he was caught and shot. We don't know where they shot him. He was already shot. He was not alive anymore. And my mother says to me, do you want to be shot like your brother Moisha? I won't let you go by all means. I said, mom, you know, you won't let me go, but I am tired of being hungry. I have only one choice, to go and drown myself in the Boog River. She said, how come? What does it mean you going down by yourself? Well, we will die just all together. We will sit down and hold together and we will die like this. I said, mama, I don't have any strength to starve. I can't starve anymore. She says, I won't let you go. When she went to my grandmother, grandfather, her father, she was there too. She says, listen, daddy, what should I do? Misha has told me if I don't let him go to get some food, he would go drown himself. He responds to her, listen, my daughter, what difference would it make for you? Either he drowns himself or he's killed on the way there. Let him go. Maybe he will be lucky to survive. We would agree that we would come out at midnight. We had to look around to wait until the guards walk away to get something for drinking. To climb up the fence, which was very high, one of us had to bend down like this. Another would climb up on his back. We would throw our satchels on that barbed wire, otherwise it would prick us. It was not an electric wire, but just a barbed wire. After the second boy climbed up the fence, he pulls the first boy up. That's why you were not able to do it alone. That was the way we escaped. It was very risky because by making the slightest noise, you would be killed easily. In the village, we could only walk at night. We could not walk in the daytime. You will ask why? Because those shepherds who pastured cattle had a very aggressive attitude towards us. They were set against the Jews by the policemen, Romanians and Germans who told them that if they catch any Jew, they should bring him or her to the police or the gendarmerie. We made that escape. And for the first time, we made it to Portniki, if I'm not mistaken. Some people gave us some bread, a few potatoes, and some beans. My companion and I filled our sacks by the next night. We tried to come back. We had to come back at night. This time we had to calculate and wait 
until the owners chained their dogs. Because the dogs were on the loose at night, we had to know all those details, a slightest whisper, and that's it, you were caught. If the dogs dogs started barking, they immediately would understand that the strangers were climbing up there. We would lay under the bushes and wait. As soon as we heard that the dogs did not bark anymore, as they used to run around the territory. So when it became quiet, it was still dark. We would creep up to the place and again, one of us would bend down and a second one would stand on the back of the first one, climb up the fence, take the sacks, throw them over the fence and pull the first one up at the fence. When we were back with food, pieces of bread, potatoes and beans, of course it was salvation. Only that was our salvation. Of course, my mother was happy that I brought out all that food there. And that you came back alive. Yes, I came back alive, you know, of course, that I came back alive. I said, Mom, you see, if you hadn't let me go, we would have died in a week or two. We just didn't have anything to eat, anything at all. She said, all is good, Sonny, but I am scared, you know. Just yesterday, right after you left, they killed five people, then two people, then three people who also made escapes. Those who were caught on the fence and those who jumped down were shot on the spot. I say, Mama, we will live as long as God lets us. It's impossible to starve. We have no strength to starve anymore. There was one boy by the name of Fima Ostrovsky. Somehow his mom walked out. She escaped from the camp to ask people in the village for some food. The policeman caught her and sat her on top of the stoking oven. It is impossible to describe all these tortures. They were walking sticks and whips. They hit people and killed people. They did whatever came to their mind. They just did that. How that process was going, did you walk into the house after looking around at first? How did you ask for food? We would walk up to the house and look whether anyone was around, and then we would walk into the house. We either would knock at the door or wait until the housewife came out. They immediately would realize who came to them, and they knew they had needed to give us even a piece of bread. Did anybody chase you away? Were there such cases? Honestly, I would tell you that 95% of the local people treated us in a human way, except for 5 to 6% of people, not more. But everybody was sympathetic. Very seldom you could hear from them that they did not have anything to give to you. Very seldom. They used to say, you poor kids. They always were sympathetic with us. They fed us a lot and gave us food. During my first walking outside the camp territory, I understood that I would not be able to get anything in Pecora. I would not be giving anything there. First time, I walked outside the camp together with the adult women. I happened to have a singing voice and started singing songs. I had joyful and sad songs in my repertoire. There were songs like, The sun raises and sets, it is dark in the camp, the guards are watching my window day and night. It was a pre-revolutionary song about staying in jail. I heard it somewhere when an adult singer was singing it, and I memorized it. Among everything that I used to sing was a, was a Ukrainian song. The neighbor had a white house. The neighbor has a pretty wife. They associated the name of that song with me. They stopped calling me by name. They called me, the neighbor has, U Susaida, and I answered to this name. It was not hard for me. I did not hide. I walked straight towards the policeman. Policeman Sir Yosha liked me the most. To me, he looked very old. I don't know his last name. He would say to me, hey, you Susaida, sing a song. And I sang. I sang not only those songs, I knew more songs, which I don't remember now. I knew 10 or 15 songs, 
and they said I had a good voice. Did you sing Ukrainian songs only? Ukrainian songs only. Well, I sang in Ukrainian for the Ukrainians. I sang both Russian and Ukrainian songs. If I was asked to sing a song and I knew it, I sang it. They knew I would come back and wouldn't leave my mother. Where is that memory and brains to remember all those houses and all those people who were saving me and all those who were chasing me away? Did such things happen? Yes, they happened, but they didn't beat me. Very seldom. I was not beaten for some reason. I don't know why. I remember how I was freezing a few times in the winter. I remember the sense when you are freezing, just like now. You want to sit down, you feel warm, you are falling asleep and dreaming about a warm oven, and then you realize that you are alone in the middle of the field. They were saying that a local guy fell in love with a Jewish girl. He brought her some food to throw over the fence, and the guards killed him. They killed many people who were buried at the Jewish mm -hmm. cemetery. They didn't even kill all those people. There was people buried alive. While walking by that burial, people felt some movement and saw evaporation from the soil. Many people came to these cemeteries, to this one and that one, near the downtown. I could see that they had cleaned it up on the right. They hired somebody to take care of that cemetery. What's your name? Olya. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much, Olya.